This podcast is part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, a program designed to help all podcasts reach their full potential. For information about joining the Robots Radio Rocket Club, check out robotsradio.net. Hey, all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hey, Shelby. Hi, Austin. Are you ready to talk about some Dragon Age? I am kind of ready. Kind of ready? Well, our topic today just isn't my favorite. Oh, right. But we have to we have to talk about this specific faction because they're a huge part of the lore. Well, it's a good transition, so who are we talking about today? We're talking about the Templars. Woohoo! Yeah, sure. To start, why don't we talk about how our first impressions of the Templars when we first saw them in game. Oh yeah, that's a great um, question. Do you want to go first or do you want me to? I can go first. I remember thinking, so because I played Dragon Age late in the game, I had played Assassin's Creed first. Right. And so Assassin's Creed, as everyone knows, also deals with Templars, except they're closer to what we would know as Templars in the Knights Templar from our real history. And so, and they're, in the early Assassin's Creed games, they're painted as the bad guys, the evil guys. Um, and so when I played that, I was like, ew, Templars, don't like that. Mm-hmm. And I, so I just kind of like, kind of got that a lot of like other media or real life influencing to the Templars. So when I saw them, I'm like, oh, they're basically just overly religious boys with a lot of power. And like in the first game, they're all men. There aren't, we don't really meet a woman Templar. I think we meet a female Templar in Awakening. Oh, well, I didn't play Awakening when I first went through. Just a comment. And that's not base game. So, so what about you? Well, I think Origins, for me, okay, so when I first played Origins, I somehow accidentally sided with the Templars, even though I, like, saved all the mages and basically was like, no, I'm going to find all these people. Like, there are still people in here. We're going to rescue everybody that we can. Somehow I ended up siding that, and then I sided with the Templars. I don't know how, but it's what happened. Whatever. So I was already annoyed at that situation. But I was even more annoyed about this whole right of annulment thing, um, which I think we can talk about a little bit later. But, you know, they just have the right to literally kill everyone in this whole circle. That doesn't seem okay. That's not right. That's not... That shouldn't be allowed, um, is what I thought going in. And, you know, I was a Dragon Age newbie, so I didn't really understand all the context or um, information or lore behind the significance of that. And, you know, not to say that killing people is okay, but, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than just whether or not you kill people. Um, So, to me, those two things really turned me off from the Templars. Um... I did not like them. And then Cullen, of course, when you meet him in Origins, you know, he's just been tortured by demons and he is not mentally coherent whatsoever. And so he's just screaming like, kill them all, kill them all. Um, And so I was like, what is happening with these people? Like, there is something not right here. So that was my first impression. Right. So as you mentioned, they're a big, big big player in Thetis. Especially as the games go on, they become an even bigger and bigger player. Um, they're kind of a secondary, I would say a secondary faction in Origins. Like, still important, and they have a main quest, but like, 
you don't really get into like meeting and working and the sort of like development of individual Templars like you get in Dragon Age 2 comparatively. That's true. Um, yeah, that's that's a fair point. And so let's just get into it because I feel like there's probably because they're so well known and we find out so much about them in game, there might be a lot of stuff that we've just kind of s- skimmed over because we don't read those codexes or we say, oh, well, we know everything we need to know about the Templars. True. Um, so let's just jump right in. Um, we always start with my fun facts and I do have several for today. Um, number one, there are at least 15 Knight Commanders in Thetis. And we'll talk about what a Knight Commander is later, but if you remember from the games, it's basically the top Templar of that particular circle. So that means there are at least 15 circles of Magi in Thetis, which is quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think there's like eight countries or so. Um, give or take a minus one or two. Um, so that's about two per country. Um, and we know that there are some countries that only have one. There are some countries that have more than two, whatever. But, um, that's, that's about how the numbers stack up. Well, and it makes sense. It does. Like you could, if you really think about like a whole continent, which is what Betis is, You might think 15 is a low number, but even though we have a good, like, I would say almost oversaturation for Thetis, magic is still a rare gift. Like, it is not something that the overall populace just can do. Right, Right. it's not definitely not the majority of people, but I hesitate to say that it's rare because that makes it sound almost insignificant. When, you know, again, we don't know the exact numbers, but like even if 20% of the population can, has the gift of magic, that's a significant amount of people. Right. And like rare is not, doesn't mean insignificant. It just means like occurrence because like, sure, magic might not, magic might have like a one in 10 chance of one in every 10 people is born with magic. But, and that's just a number I made up. I don't know if that's an actual fact. Um, right. They still, that one person can decimate all the other ten, or all the other nine, easily. So, like, magic yeah, is mean, obviously significant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but I forgot to mention that that number, that 15, does not include to venter. Of course, because they have totally different, they have a totally different structure um, for all of this stuff. So, Tevinter is excluded from everything we have to say here today. And we will do a whole episode on the Tevinter Chantry and itself. So, if you want to know about Tevinter in there, we don't worry. We'll dive into that. We'll get to that in a later episode because it really yeah, deserves we're... its own thing. Yes, it does. We are getting there. Um... But next is the fact that Templars are often recruited as children or young teenagers. Um, And we know this firstly from Alistair, but also through a lot of different characters we meet in the games as well. The majority of Templars are male, but there are some female Templars. And there are some female Templars that we have met um, that do really significant things. Knight Commander Um, Meredith. I was not referring to her. I was referring to Evangeline de Brassard, but whatever. Well, Cassandra, too. <laughs> we'll get into Meredith. We'll get into Meredith later. Um, <clears throat> so non-human Templars are very, very rare. Um, it almost never happens, but I couldn't find, I couldn't find an explicit example of like, yes, here's an example of a non-human Templar um, in the lore, now that I say that, I'm sure there's going to be somebody that's like, oh, hey, here's one. But I didn't want to say zero because technically they could be if they really wanted to be. Um, But it's very rare. It's also a thing about, for me at least, like, well, dwarfs, I assume, are 
in the same way unable to become Templars just as they are unable to become mages. Um, that we know of. That we know of. So maybe, I don't know, Dinsing. I think, so we're dealing mainly with humans and elves. Because and Kunari. Kunari, yeah, but... I feel, after learning about pa- Parvalin and everything, even a Talvashaw for a Kunari to join the Chantry would be a betrayal even worse than being Talvashaw. I think it would definitely be anathema to the, most of the Kunari, but I also think it makes sense because they hate magic so much. Yes. So I think it would make sense for a Talvashoth to become a Templar because they are thinking, oh my gosh, I hate magic. Yeah, let me be part of this group that controls and eradicates it. Um, So I think you could go back and forth on that one. And then my last fun fact is that romantic involvement with anyone, but especially with mages, is deeply discouraged by the Templars. However... It happens more frequently than you might think. Well, they're just funny. Some of my favorite dialogue revolves around Templars and romantic involvement. For once, okay, uh, Anders will say to uh, Aveling on if you she ever did role play with Wesley. And he would list some very popular Templar role plays, role plays, which is the uh, Templar and the apostate, the Templar and the desire demon. What did Aveline say to this? Um, she was appalled. Yeah, classic. And kind of in the, tracks. I'll kick your butt if you don't shut up. Again, that tracks. Um, and then, obviously conversations with Cullen and you can when you in the quest um I think enemies among us in Dragon Age 2 where you go and you have to find the Templar Wilman Wilman or yeah um you go to the um Blooming Rose and they're like, oh, yeah, we see ev- almost every Templar in here for business. All right. Well, are you ready to, ready to move on to the structure? Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> okay, so at the top is the Knight Vigilant. And this is the leader of the Order. They rule from the White Spire in Val Royale, and they are, like, basically in charge of all of the Templars. Hmm. Just below this is the Knight Divine, and this is a division of Templars who directly serve the Divine. They manage day-to-day operations, and a lot of times um, this is where the female Templars will be sent, which I think can be a little bit annoying, but also makes sense because the Divine is a woman. Um, And everyone around the Divine is mainly women. Not everyone, but a significant portion, yeah. Um, so just under the Knight Divine are all of the Knight Commanders. And like we've already established, there are about 15 of these in Thetis. And the Knight Commander is the leader of a main branch, like a circle. Um, or even a group of Templars in a particular Chantry. So this is similar to when we talked about the Warden Commanders. They're the leader of a group of Grey Wardens in a particular country. The same is true for this. The Knight Commander is the leader of a main branch of Templars. And then just under the Knight Commander is the Knight Captain. This is the second in command to the Knight Commander, and they have the ability actually to check the power of the Knight Commander. Um, going so far as they're able to relieve them of their power if they overstep. This is what Cullen should have done to Meredith, like, in Act 1, almost. Um, Which, I mean, I think he alludes to in Inquisition, talking about how he should have stepped in sooner. Um, So, that's the Night Captain. And then under this are two more um, ranks that 
we don't really know a lot about what these two do or what distinguishes them, but we do know that these are two more ranks. And that's the Knight Lieutenant and the Knight Corporal. And then next is the Knight Templar or just Templar. This is the base rank and file member of the order. And then finally is the Templar Recruit, and that is a new recruit who has not yet been officiated into the Templar Order. And if you're like me, you might be asking the question, where the heck is the Knight Vigilant in Inquisition? Well, the answer is, they're dead. Is that really the answer? Yep. Do we have a name? No, but they died in the Conclave. The Conclave. Well, that makes sense. Um, Which is so interesting because Grand Enchanter Fiona is not at the Conclave. That's a whole thing about, like, when you meet her. Yeah, does she say why? She said that she didn't feel like negotiating was beneficial. Well, I guess that makes sense, you know, because she is the, like, leader of this splinter group that breaks off and wants independence. So I guess that makes sense from a logistical perspective. She also says, like, she felt like it was a trap, maybe. Um, I can't remember the conversations exactly. And so she sent representatives as opposed to going herself so that the, if things went south, they wouldn't be leaderless, which, you know, Lord Seeker Lucius is also not at the conclave though that it's unclear when the, um, the envy demon impersonate takes over, takes over. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a really good point. But, you know, I don't think the Lord Seeker would have gone anyway because the Lord Seeker prior to him is Lord Seeker Lambert, which you can read about that in the Asunder novel. And they both were kind of in this camp of, no, I'm in charge. You need to bow down to what I want and what I say. And so this conversation about it is pointless unless you are just going to side with me and say, yeah, okay, I'll bow down and listen to you, which they're not going to do because that's not, that's not in, in their nature. So, um, any other thoughts about the ranks and structure? No, not really. Other than that. I thought of, oh, the Night Vigilant is in an Inquisition because Corypheus. Right, 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 right. Well, let's move on to ancient history a little bit. Um, so I think this is pretty common knowledge, but might be a surprise to some of you, especially if you haven't played Inquisition fully. But the Templars originated from the first Inquisition, which was founded around minus 100 ancient Um, And this predates the formation of the Chantry by about 90 years or so. So their job under the banner of the First Inquisition was somewhat similar to their job in modern Thetis, with one big exception. Um, And that's that the First Inquisition traveled around Thetis instead of being stationary in one city or place. And they hunted down dangerous apostates, heretics, abominations, demons etc. Um, they, they traveled, they were nomadic, they did not, they were not stationary in one location. Um, so finally the Chantry is formed and they convinced the first Inquisition to unite under their own banner. So it was at this point when the first Inquisition joined the Chantry when they split into two groups, the Seekers and the Templars. Prior to this point, they were the same entity. Um, there was no distinction between them. This happened officially in 120 Divine and is marked by the signing of the Navarran Accord. You will you will hear characters, NPCs reference the Navarran Accord pretty frequently. You can talk to Cass about it. Um, there is, I think, some conversation in the epilogue of Asunder about it as well. So the signing of the Navarran Accord really is like the formation of the official Templar order. Right. Um, so, and this formation lasts until 940, um, 940 dragon 
with the Mage Templar War breaking out. Um, and that's, you know, what we're dealing with in Inquisition. So that's a long time for an organization to stand and last. Um, who knows what it will look like going forward in the next game. But that's what it looked like up until then. So uh, I was wrong. I, I realized as I was doing that, I was looking up because the Navarro Accords are obviously like a super important thing and like the historic moment when Lord Seeker Lambert is basically like, nah, forget that. We're going to be our own thing. Um, And so the Night Vigilant, his name is Trent Watch, he does survive the Conclave. Oh, okay. Um, And we can kind of get into, if you want me to wait, I can tell you what happens to him when we get into more modern history or we can go now. Let's do now. All right, uh, so Trent Watch is, he's effectively, you know, put, he's basically put out of power when Lord Seeker Lambert, annul, like, annuls the Navarra Accords and separates the Seekers and Templars from the Chantry. Um, and so the Seekers take control over both groups of the Seekers and the Templars. Right. Um, which we'll get into how that happens when we get to our Seeker episode. Um, and so he somehow, Trent Watch somehow survives the Conclave. Uh, then after the Conclave, the Envy Demon, posing as Lord Seeker Lucius, uh, he sends a letter to Trent Watch asking him to sneak into, uh, uh, Theron 4 Readout, which is where Champion of the Just takes place. Um, under the cover night and see him in the Knight Commander Denim's office. During Champions of the Just, the Inquisitor can discover Trenchwatch's body in Denim's office. It is unclear why and if Denim killed the Knight Vigilant or if the Envy Dem- Demon killed him instead. That's interesting. I, I remember this now vaguely because denim is or turns into a um red lyrium behemoth but one of the behemoths that you fight in the the destruction of haven um so you know you could you could have a little hypothesis that Denim was already ingesting the the red lyrium at that point and and probably was was entranced and enthralled by the envy demon. So honestly, it doesn't really matter if it was the envy demon or denim because they were all on the same side, right? Right. And this just a little bit off topic, but this just gets into a thing of like kind of solidifying the timeline. So obviously the envy demon comes into play sometime either right after the Conclave or before the Conclave. I would argue... I don't think we know when. I know. I would... I'm tending to believe before because that's why Lord Seeker Lucius doesn't go to the Conclave. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that would mean that Corypheus must have used a body of one of the Grey Wardens you kill in the Legacy DLC to regenerate himself. And so all while this Mage Templar War is happening, Corypheus is playing his thing. Right. Well, I mean, there's not a lot of time in between the breaking out of the war and the Conclave. So, yeah, but I, I, I do agree with you that, that Corypheus definitely probably used uh, one of the bodies of the, the dead Grey Wardens there to regenerate. Because I find it hard to believe that he would use the body of a Darkspawn. Unless he, if he had another option. Right. So probably, yeah, in whichever warden you don't side with. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on a little bit because we're really off topic. Yeah, sorry. So um, the Templars are considered by the commoners, like the common regular people in Thetis. Um, they are considered to be the saviors of Thetis and holy warriors. Um, protecting the world from the dangers of magic that is left to go unchecked. And, um, you know, we can discuss whether or not that's an accurate picture, but for the average everyday, like, farmer who lives in 
you know, the middle of Ferelden who, you know, doesn't own land, isn't powerful. They're not a mage themselves. They don't have, they don't have training, um, in, in fighting. I can understand that perspective a little bit. Um, even if it is a little bit misguided, um, because yeah, the Templars, they swoop in and they, you know, destroy abominations and demons and basically give you your life back when you thought you were going to get killed. So I can understand how they would look at them as heroes, um, even when they also, you know, commit atrocities and all kinds of things. Um, so well, and I think it comes back to kind of what you said. And, you know, we talked about this in the Great Warden episode, how, like, when you get into Origins, like, no one really views you as, like, heroic or a hero. Even though the Great Wardens are these heroes of legend who stop the Blight and the Darkspawn. Um, but it makes sense that the Templars would be that because especially with the people who subscribe to the Chantry, I mean, you're told magic is this, you know, evil thing that maybe not directly evil, but you hear horror stories of abominations and demons and blood mages in every corner. It's like stuff of nightmares. And here, here are these warriors who stand between them and you. Right, and if you even go back to the theology, right, of the Chantry, the Chantry blames the Magisters and their magic for destroying the Golden City and making it the Black City. So, you know, we can kind of brush that off as, oh, that's not really true, or yeah, okay, that is true, or actually, you know, that was Arlathan, not the Black City, or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters to the people is the fact that they believe it, and not even that, but also the fact that it functions in this religion as a negative thing about magic so even if you do or do not believe that in the universe you're still if you grow up around the chantry you're still going to associate magic with negativity with evil with badness because of that theological statement unless of course you do the work of like deconstructing and unpacking that belief which let's be honest most people in Thetis don't have that luxury it also makes sense because the Chantry is born out of a time where Matt Deventer Matt Magisters are enslaving the world and Deventer is using magic to rule over man. I mean, I think that right. the line, magic must be used to serve man but never to rule over him, isn't about the blight, it's about Deventer. I wholly, wholly agree with that. Because Taventer is using magic to literally enslave other people, to dominate and enslave people. When 99% of the mages and the rest of Thetis, they don't want that. Especially if they had grown up in a place where their magic was nurtured and encouraged and told that, hey, this is a gift, not a curse. They, most people would not grow up to want to enslave people and want unlimited power that comes from demons. Most people are going to grow up and want to nurture their gifts, of course, um, but not necessarily become this like all powerful creature that that is susceptible to demons and will kill you if you look at them wrong. Like that's just how people work. Um, so that's my big gripe with the Chantry. Um, but let's let's get back to our notes a little bit. Um, so the Templars are the military arm of the Chantry. Um, they are primarily recruited for their abilities, you know, to fight, for their martial skills, um, at least for maybe not already having all of those things but their capacity to their potential and they're also recruited um, based on their religious dedication to the maker which you know again makes sense they are a military arm but they're also a religious organization um 
And, you know, given the difficult choices that Templars have to make while serving as a Templar, it makes sense that they would need to be loyal at, to a fault to the order and also maintain like an emotional distance from the mages. Um, and, you know, I was reading in the, the wiki page for the Templar order and it said that a Templar's obedience is more important to the Chantry than, the, than his or her moral center which I totally agree with that, that that is valued more, but I also think that is the whole entire problem with the Templars in general. That one sentence sums it up. Yeah. And I think it just like, it really paints in a picture into where, how that, that mentality gets us to where we are in mm -hmm. 940 dragon and right because that mentality gives them absolute power mm -hmm. and they no one should have absolute power no and it, it gets to a point of like because the templars are expected to have this loyalty and obedience to the chantry they expect it of their mage charges they expect loyalty to the maker, you mean? Loyalty to the maker, to the circle, to all of that. Like, yeah, that's an expectation because they're taught that's what gives them the most value. So that's what they're going to value in other people. Mm -hmm. Right, which is not necessarily true. And I don't even think most mages would would value that. Um, I'm, I'm sure some would, but I don't think that would be universal the way it is for Templars. I think things. mages... If I had to get based on the games, mages value maining, maintaining control of themselves. Your everyday mage, the thing that they find that they ho want to hold on to more than anything is control of themselves. Whether that be giving Autonomy. themselves over to a demon and becoming, you know, an abomination or the you know, vice versa, becoming tranquil and losing all of that. I don't understand how either of those things let you be in control. No, I'm saying that's what they, the average mage doesn't want either of those options to happen because they want to be in control of who they are. Right. Yeah. They value autonomy to a fault. And you know what? Why, why wouldn't they? Of course, when they've been controlled and demonize their whole lives, of course they would value having autonomy um, to make their own decisions in whatever ways they can when they live in the circle. I think that makes sense. Well, I think now is a good time for our break. I agree. Um, so let's go on to the break. Uh, we have some exciting news um, to share. And so we'll see you all after the break. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story. Available now. So, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this. I'm listening. Ah, oh, you've returned! A letter arrived for you. Hello, and welcome to the mid-break of the episode, where we just take time to let you know of what's going on with the podcast. And the first thing we want to bring your attention to is our we do we are on Patreon. Uh, you can find us on there. The link is in the episode description or in the description of any episode previous. Um, so you can look there as well. 
Um, we want to let you know that we're running a promotion that the first five people who sign up for the Patreon, regardless of the tier that you sign up at, you will have your name read out on every episode of the show from now until you the end of time or whatever at such a time you cease your Patreon contribution. Um, so that's kind of a promo. The first five people will have their name read out on the episode, every episode. Um, so yeah, again, you can find that link in the description. There are various tiers with various benefits. Um, again, the promotion applies to the first five, regardless of the tier in which you contribute to. Um, and we do have some good news. We do have our first patron. Um, Lisa Max has joined the patron at tier one. Um, and so thank you, Lisa, for your contribution and your support of the show. Um, as always, if you cannot support us financially, that is totally okay. We understand that life gets to what it is and situations are different. But if you want to support us, if you like what we do, please hop onto Spotify or Apple or anywhere and you can rate us and review us. Um, if you give us a five-star review and write us some words on Apple, uh, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. Unfortunately, right now, Spotify is just a star rating. They don't have an option for you to review, but those stars are greatly appreciated on Spotify, so you can go and do that. You can do both or either or, um, whichever one suits you. You do not even have to listen on those platforms to do that. If you have an account, you can just go and do that too. All right, so we do have a review and Shelby's going to read that. I do, and I am. So this review is from CIC3R0, and this person says, A great find. I was craving some quality background and lore on Dragon Age and found the lore cast. Episode 1 had me hooked, and I'm currently happily binging it all as I type. Great job. Your passion for the game and the lore shows in your cast. Keep it up. Thank you so much, CIC. We're so grateful for your great review. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And lastly, we're going to end with our Heroes, Hawks, and Heralds. And so Shelby also has one of those to share with us today. I do. So this hero is from the famous Genesis and Genesis's hero is named Switch, and she is a castless female dwarf, and she hasn't made quite all of the critical decisions yet, but she does hope to recruit all party members and keep everyone alive. She sent Morrigan into the Fade and kept both Isolde and Connor alive. Switch also brokered peace with the wolves, werewolves and the elves, and Switch sided with the mages during the circle quest and does plan to have Alistair have the old god baby with Morrigan and she wants to rule Ferelden as Alistair's consort. Woohoo, big plans, big plans. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Genesis, for highlighting and sending us your hero and you know what y'all we don't have that many heroes hawks or heralds that have been sent to us so um we would love to keep this little segment going so make sure you send us your hero hawk or your herald any of your original characters will work perfectly um and you can send those to us on our discord in twitter dms or even just posting it on your Twitter and tagging us. Um, we would love to continue this segment, but we need a few more characters to do that. So make sure you send yours in. All right. Well, let's get back to it on this episode. My friend. You fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes. Swooping is bad. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Do you know what makes your video game bay tick? Have you ever wondered how they stack up against all the rest of the delectable digital dates? I'm Genesis, and we analyze and review all of your favorite video game romances. 
I'm Vervada. Check out our podcast, Two Girls, One Ship, on all your favorite podcast places. Remember, beauty is in the eye of the controller. All right, so the last major thing I want to talk about with the Templars is their abilities and, like, current issues that plague them, which we've already delved into a little bit. Um, But let's talk about their abilities first. So I do have a question. My question is regards, so the Templars are the military arm of the Chantry. But if I understand the history... Right, when an exalted march is called, it's, they use both the Templars and the army of Orlais. Sure. I have no idea. Oh, sorry. (laughs) I have no idea the answer to that question. (gasps) Why? What, what does that, what, what difference does that make? Well, it make to me, it makes a difference because... Orle has this relationship with the Chantry of, like, the line between Empress and Chantry, like, Empire and Chantry is much more blurred in Orle than it is in, say, Ferelden or in some of the free marches, certain well, free marches. Well, I think to be fair to Orle, which I know we struggle with, um... I think any country would really struggle with that line if the Chantry was based in their country. The Chantry is based in Val Royale. You know, that's where the divine lives. That's where the Chantry is headed up. So it's kind of like, almost like the Pope, you know? Like, I'm sure the Pope and the ruler of Italy walk a very fine line, you know, between that power dynamic. Um... So I, I think that's, to be fair to them, uh, I think that would be true for anyone, not just Orle. Right, right, right. And so that's why I was wondering if, like, because I find it, I find it difficult that for the Ferelden Chantry to order anything for Ferelden to do, like the King of Ferelden. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I mean, it's a totally different context. Right, but whereas if the Divine says something, the people of Orlais are going to take notice of that. And even the rulers are going to do that. So I was just just curious if, like, when an exalted march is called, if Orlais or wherever it's called is expected to provide soldiers for that, or if it's they just send the Templars. I don't know. Um, We can talk about that whenever we talk about exalted marches and, you know, five seasons or whenever <laughs> all right no, whatever. sorry to deal with us i just that was a that's question. okay that's a that's a fair comment um so let's get back to templar abilities so prior to taking their vows the templar recruits undergo a vigil um it's kind of reminds me of a lot of the other factions we have talked about or will talk about you know the gray warden recruits undergo a joining the um the circle mages when they leave the apprenticeship and become full mages they have to undergo their harrowing seekers have to also undergo a vigil which we'll talk about later um but templars also have to undergo a vigil fun fact fun fact so in the fade when you go into the fade and inquisition and you are fighting the fear spiders both the vigil the harrowing and the joining are all individual fear spiders. Yeah, you are such a nerd about the fear spiders. They make me laugh. So, during the vigil, the Templar is given a filter, which is their first, like, draft of lyrium, which gives them their powers. Um, and it's at this point where... They officially become a Templar, and really their life is changed because Inquisition really goes deep into the uh, lyrium addiction issues that Templars face, and this is the moment where that starts. Um, and you know, when you're when you're constantly taking a drug, and you're forced to take it for your job, there's no way that you can't become addicted. You know, like. It's just a matter of time. Um, 
so this is the beginning of their addiction, which is a really sad way to look at it, but I think it's the truth, um, and we want to be truthful. So, um, in addition, the Templar Order also um, dictates that Templars, um, they don't, like, seek ambition and glory for themselves. They don't seek wealth or acknowledgement or glory. They seek to serve the maker. Um, their lives belong to the maker and the path that they've chosen to be part of the Templar order. And so all of these vows, they take all these vows um, right after or during this vigil. Um, and then after the vigil, they are officially a Templar. So Templars, when we talk about um, their abilities and their fighting style, it, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how they're specifically trained to counter and deny magic. Um, when a mage or like a demon or abomination or, or anything seeks to work magic, they tap into the fade in order to reshape reality. A Templar's ability basically closes off the mage's access to the fade. So that means all of their magical effects dissipate. It goes away. And the mage is unable to change the world in front of them. So from a mage's perspective, Templars reinforce reality, which means they make it so that spells cannot be cast in the first place. Um, they can't get in touch with the Fade. They can't you know, reshape or alter that reality and they can't cast spells. And the Seekers also share all of these powers that we just talked about, um, even though they go through a totally different uh, vigil and, and process by which they get powers, um, the Templars and, and the Seekers share this level of ability. Um, and some Seekers and Templars even believe that their abilities are gifts from the Maker. Um, so, yeah, do you have any thoughts so far, Austin, about Templars generally? Just that, like, I think that Templars get a lot of deserved hate in both in-universe and in the fandom. Um, especially in Dragon Age 2, like, they are pretty marked as, like, these oppressors, and they do oppress mages in a sense of that. And even, like, they contribute to the oppression of elves and other groups, non-human groups in Thetis. Um, but I think that it doesn't negate the necessity of Templars for me in the universe. Um, and I think that it's a fine line to wanting the Templars to be as they should, which is a protection against mages. Because, I mean, unchecked, Taventer would have enslaved the entire world. Um, Taventer magisters breached the Fade and caused the Blight. Whether they got into the Golden City or whatever, Corypheus is living proof that he went into the Fade a man and left a Darkspawn. Uh, True. And so... I think that in that situation, the Templars are needed because an, an unchecked mage who wants to wield devastating power can do devastating things to such a large number of people. And so I think that Inquisition does them an injustice in a way, even though, you know, and we'll talk about him later, but Sir Barris is a very beloved character by the fandom. And, you know, Alistair and Cullen both have art, have Templar backgrounds and all of that. But I just think that Templars are necessary to the world of Thetis. I just don't know if I agree with that. Because, like, yeah, mages are dangerous. But again, talking going back to what I said earlier, like, if they totally changed the way that they viewed magic and not like in the whole language in the, the chant of light, but like 
if they viewed it as a gift that should be nurtured and used to benefit society, not to oppress other people or hurt other people, but to benefit and grow yourself and your community. Like that would be such a more healthy way of looking at it. And then you just, you just wouldn't have these issues to the same extent that you do now. Like you wouldn't have people being so afraid of magic. You wouldn't have the amount of people turning to demons and, um, spirits to give them new powers. You wouldn't have as many mages becoming, um, abominations. You just, you just wouldn't, um, you would, you would have mages that are nurtured, um, in their lives and are allowed to like fulfill their calling in life, you know? Um, and so then Templars could become something else that protects the mages from, the public. Like, I think that's what they really should be doing. Um, because mages are an oppressed group of people in universe, in lore. So they should be protecting mages, not further oppressing them, which, you know, if you've played Dragon Age 2, you know, that whole game is about unfair and unjust treatment of mages by the Templars, specifically by Meredith, but by all of them. So, I get what you're saying and I definitely get your point of view, but yeah, maybe I'm just thinking about this in terms of like an ideal world and what I would love to see personally. Um, but those are my thoughts. I think that you have a good point and I do think that mages should be nurtured. Um, it's one of the reasons that I think that Cassandra is the best pick for divine. Um, because I think that she would bring a good portion of like she can she would care for want to care for mages and want to see mages not abused and oppressed and things but at the same place would want to bring the templars and the seekers to where they want to be um so yeah that's really it i just think that when someone can decimate an entire city by themselves there has to be something that can regulate that that's fair well let's move on into some known templars all right you want me to read the list why not okay so known templars are obviously carver hawk if he is not brought to the deep roads will join the templar order because he's carver um uh, Colin, obviously, uh, both you meet Colin both as Templar and as an ex-Templar, which I think is an interesting uh, development. Um, obviously, we talked about Knight Commander or er, Knight Captain Denim, Del Ren Barris, who we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, Emric, who we meet in Dragon Age Two, Evangeline De Bessard. Get that right, shall we? Mostly. Okay. Um, Knight Commander Gregor, who is the Knight Commander of the Ferelden Circle during Origins. Henrik, uh, Meredith, uh, Stenard, who is the Knight Commander in Kirkwall. Otto, Otto Ulrich, uh, Raleigh Sampson, Rylin and Rylene, I'm assuming. Is that mm-hmm. the difference between those two? Um, Thrask, Wesley Villain, and Wilman. Wilmod, who uh, frequents the Blooming Rose in Dragon Age 2. And obviously there are more than just these, but these are some of the significant ones that we encounter in quests and all those kind of things. Right. And even though you can, as almost every protagonist, gain a specialization in Templar, you do not technically join the Order. No, you do not. Which I think is an interesting thing about using the abilities, but not joining the Order. Which, you know, Origins does a good thing about that, because Alistair's basically like, no, I will not teach you how to do this unless you have really high approval, because I'm not supposed to teach these secrets. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so, this we're about to go into our side character, um, which I alluded to is... Delren or Delreen, Delren, I'm assuming. Barris. Delren. Delren Barris, 
who we meet in Inquisition. Um, and so, Shelby, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so um, Delrin Barris, he's one of my favorites, and I really liked him before I did all this research on him, um, and then doing all this research on him made me like him so much more. Um, so I think he's one of the good Templars that are out there. Um, so if you really like the Templars and you're mad at me for talking smack about them, here I am. I really like Delrin, so there you go. Um so Barris is a Templar that we meet in Dragon Age Inquisition and you really get to know him if you side with the Templars um, and I kind of think that most people probably side with the mages because um, the game kind of pushes you towards that um, but honestly I I tend to side with the Templars just just for Barris and also because the fight at Haven is easier <laughs> If you side with the Templars. Um, but Barris is awesome and I really like him. So if you don't side with the Templars, you also see him in the very beginning of the game when you go to Val Royo for the very first time. He is the Templar that questions uh, Lucius in like the direction that the Templars and the Seekers are, are going. Um, and he basically gets yelled at, but that's, that's Barris. So, Delrin Barris comes from a noble Ferelden family. He's the second son of Ban Jevrin Barris. They live in northwestern Ferelden near Lake Callanhad. And there have been other notable knights in their line. Kenum Barris fought in 650 steel against the Avar during their invasion of the Ferelden Lowlands and saved the life of Terran Lewis Mavbray, who was the future King of Thetis. And another famous Templar in his line is Alara Barris, who took up arms against the Orlesian occupiers in 898 Blessed and successfully drove them from her family's holdings. So Barris comes from a line that has multiple Templars and multiple notable Templars um, in his lineage. So Delrin is sent to the Templars at the age of 12. And um, we can find a letter um, that his dad wrote about him in a letter to the Knight Commander. And so I just brought a snippet from that letter because I think it really sums up his character. So this is what his dad said about him. Delrin has the stomach for fighting, but not a love for it. The boy is even-tempered, thinks swiftly, and shows no interest in the affairs of a band. Train him as a knight, and he will grow into a man who does the order credit. And I think his father was 100% correct right on the money um, in this letter that he wrote about his son. Well, the World of Thetis Encyclopedia says that these words that Barris's father wrote were prophetic. Barris's first mission was to hunt down rumors of apostates in Dragon's Peak. Unfortunately, this mission went sideways real fast and turned into an all-out brawl between a cult of blood mages, an unbound pride demon, a passing Dalish clan, two seekers, some Talvashoth mercenaries, and of course the squad of Templars. So in this in this fight, Delrin was not the squad leader of the Templars. Instead, the squad leader had been killed in the fight. But his fellow Templars were so impressed by Delrin that they elected him in the field to be the unofficial leader of their squad for the rest of the mission. The brawl lasted for another three days. Eventually, the Templars emerged victorious. And Barris had this to say about the mission. The demon has been slain, the mages are subdued, the Kunari freed, the seekers mollified, and the Dalish returned to the woods. 
A bard then came upon them and wanted all the details of this story, of course, as they, as they are wont to do. Delrin gave him a quote. Del Delrin gave him, quote, a brief and sober account. This bard, known as Philium, a bard, wrote a book of poems called Thunder Upon the Mountains, The Battle for the Heart of Dragon's Peak, about this very mission. And this story is now one of the most popular stories in Eastern Ferelden. So that's just Barris's early life. Like this is when he's a young Templar. Um, and he goes on, you know, he goes on to um, stand up for justice during the Inquisition. He fights against the Red Lyrium. And um, if he survives the battle at Theronfall Redoubt, he, um, you can recruit him into the Inquisition and he becomes um, one, of, one of your recruits. So that's a little bit about Barris. I really like him. I think he has a lot of character, a lot of integrity, and um, I wish he was a party member, honestly. Yeah. Um, I really like Barris too in that um, I think Barris, along with Cullen and a few others, Thrask maybe, really kind of exemplar like exemplify what a Templar should be. Um, mm -hmm. What, which I think at the end of the day, a Templar should be someone who wants to protect the people, the people they're charged with in the circle and the people of where their circle inhabits. They are meant to protect people and to do that. And I think that Barris's mis first mission really sums up on that because he mentions every group of people. And not one of them was really fully, like he said, oh, we killed them all. Um, right. And I think that that's kind of where he is. And the statement his dad says about the stomach for battle, but no love for it. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of the reluctant warrior trope that we see a lot in fantasy. Um, but to me, that just exemplifies like what it means to be a Templar and like, is a good pull for siding with the Templars other than the kind of metagaming thing that Haven is easier if you side with the Templars. Um, it is. It is easier. Right. Which if you're trying to get that slow and steady achievement where you need to be. Um, yeah, I know. I'm trying. And so he is just a really kind of class act and everything. And, I like him a lot better than Fiona. Me too. Um, and I haven't read The Calling, so I haven't gotten a little, like I haven't gotten any more of Fiona than the little bit we get in Inquisition. But we talked about this earlier, but like her reasons for not being at the Conclave to me are a little sketch. She's just a little sketch. Here's my opinion. And maybe this is controversial. Maybe this is a hot take. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, the Fiona in The Calling and the Fiona that we meet in Inquisition are two different characters to me. Like, they are not the same. They are not the same. We are not the same person. Mm. Like, it's just, they're, they're not the same. Like, even her description in the book is, looks nothing like, um, who we meet in Inquisition. So, honestly, I just chalk it up to they're different people. Right. And I just don't feel like there's such like a casual like throwaway line where Th Fiona basically like name drops Alistair to the Inquisition. Does she use his name or does she just say like my son or whatever? No, she says Alistair. Yeah, I don't like her characterization in Inquisition. It's one of my biggest gripes with the game. Um, so yeah, I think that I just really like Barris. Yeah, he's a great one. Well, do you have any other thoughts about the Templars? No, I don't have any more thoughts. Do you? No, we have exhausted all of mine. All right. Well, well then we'll see you next time on the Dragon Age Lorecast. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. 
If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at dalorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games, from major characters who define the course of a game's storyline to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. How well do you know your video game lovers? Have you ever wondered how your video game bays stack up against all the other delectable digital dates? I'm Genesis, the girl whose motto in life is love, laugh, tequila. And on Two Girls, One Ship, we analyze, rate, and review all that the world of video game romances has to offer. And I'm Vervada, the hopeless romantic cat lady and lifelong gamer. But you should know that our podcast centers on character and romance analysis and doesn't shy away from exploring the fun of physical connection. Or from the deep emotional connections built between two characters, using specific in-game dialogue and the overall narrative journey. So join the two girls, one ship, shipsters, and remember... Beauty is in the eye of the controller.